Hello and welcome to the Indian Writers Forum. Today we have with us Abu Bakar Adam Ibrahim. He is the author of a short story collection, uh, and but we'll be discussing his uh, latest novel, which is, is which is also his first novel called Season of Crimson Blossoms. This is the book. Um, just a brief introduction, and but uh, I think this is just a sort of formal introduction. We'll we'll learn more about the author as we talk. Uh, he he has been a journalist for several years. His debut short story collection, The Whispering Trees, was published in 2012, and it was long listed for the. Eti Salat Prize for Literature in 2014. Um, he's, he's also been a Gabriel Garcia Marquez Fellow in 2013, got several other fellowships. Um, and for this particular novel, he won the NLNG Nigeria Prize for Literature. That's quite a resume. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, for, thank you for your time. It's a pleasure, really. I thought I'd, I'd first begin with, uh, with, 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 with the novel. Um, uh, in in this particular novel, uh, you you seem to work with uh, the rea the reality of Nigeria, but at the same time, uh, you do not seem to be too influenced by say uh, in international the the things that 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 have sort of had a trend in international fiction, say magic realism. You sort of still try and s stick to social realism and or. or or other other traditional forms. Why is that? Because the story dictated it, essentially. I mean, it was a story that was very grounded in realism. So uh, I felt that for it to have that the impact that it should have, it should be this way. Um, I I love magic realism, but uh, and it's it's reflected in my first collection of short stories. But you know, some stories come to you and dictate this is the way they want to be told. And this is the way this one was told. Um, I mean, it's, it's a very deliberate choice to kind of project this image um, because the characters involved live this reality. Yeah? For them, this is it. The element of magic realism that kind of um, reflected in the story is uh, where, where some people thought uh, Fire is one of the characters who was traumatized, might be possessed by jinns. Mm. And uh, there, there was the instance of a character who exercises uh, demons or jinns who possess people. Um, but that wasn't what I really wanted to focus on. I wanted to focus on the relationship between the characters right. and uh, ground the story in a very contemporary nature. Abu Bakr, uh, when I was reading your, your, your book, especially the initial pages have, have these characters which are constantly talking to each other. And, uh, it's, and of course, you have that first element of drama where yeah. the, that uh, the one character breaks in. But at the same time, you are actually really depicting female characters and their conversations. Uh, there is again in, uh, say, uh, certain parts in the West that they think that you should always write your real self and, you know, it's, 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 it's problematic if you take another person's uh, voice. But you, you seem to be taking on that challenge and doing pretty well with that. Who has governance over whose voice you should use? I think people should write what they want to write, essentially. And uh, if your characters dictate stories to you, then I think it's fine. The voice of Binta is nobody's voice, but Binta's voice. And uh, she gave me the license to use it, and I used it. And that's it. Um, you know, this question of appropriation of voices, of um, experiences, of stories, they are issues that have to be considered with, with uh, sensibility and, and uh, ration reasonably as well. Um, Sometimes we say, oh, you don't, you shouldn't tell somebody else's story. And I, I think sometimes those arguments are valid. But then I think, again, sometimes people use that as a form of protectionism to, to kind of keep away certain people. Um, I've always insisted that your experiences are your experiences and they will remain your experiences until you make them a story. And if someone else is accesses your experience, either through research and observation and perhaps immersing himself in that experience and is able to write about it convincingly, then I also think it is fine. Um, you know, I've been reading a book about, uh, I've, re I've read a lot on slavery recently and some of them are written by African-Americans. 
some by Nigerians, you know, and, and there's one that I read recently written by an English woman who wrote in the voice of some slaves. Uh, and of course, you have to ask yourself, is she appropriating? Is she engaging with, with uh, the issues that are relevant? Is she romanticizing slavery? But the basic thing is that slavery was something that concerned the Africans, the um, non-Africans who invested in the slave trade. And even, even elsewhere where slavery occurred in different forms, you know. So it's, it's a shared experience and people have a right to access the stories and tell them from their own point of view. That's how I say it. So, but, um, you know, with, with, with my characters, it was debatable at some point because I had to kind of sit down and do <coughs> some kind of, um, you know, inquisition of myself if you want, because at that period, I was going through a stretch where I was writing stories. And most of the stories, most of the characters that came to me were very strong female characters. And they spoke through me. And I had to ask myself, am I appropriating or am I telling the stories of my character? And I just believed, well, in the end, I was telling the stories of my characters and I was telling it as faithfully as possible. And uh, if it relates or other women relate to these experiences, absolutely fine and good. If they don't, then it's unfortunately the story of my character and that's it. Abubakar, my next question uh, would be about your uh, literary influences. Uh, uh, I, I understand that uh, I'm sure you're familiar with several languages uh, and uh, in, in, in spoken in Nigeria and uh, there, are, there, are, there, there are literary traditions there as well as there's the literary tradition through translations and, and of course the English uh, literary tradition. So, so who are your influences, major influences in terms of your writing? I am influenced by every writer I read, either for good reasons or bad ones. Um, you know, and I suppose that is the case with, with um, all writers as well. Uh, you know, you learn it every day and uh, you see things you don't want to do, you know, uh, that don't work, especially. But in terms of major influence, there, there are quite a few. Um, you know, Abu Bakr Imam, for instance, he's, he's this fabulous writer who wrote in Hausa uh, from the 1930s upwards. And, and his, uh, he, he was an influence in terms of the uh, storytelling technique, the narrative form, and this engagement with elements of magical realism as well. Um, which, which brings me to Gabriel Garcia Marquez, you know, who is someone I really, really admire. And uh, I had the opportunity of going to his village where he was born, you know. And during the fellowship? Him, yeah, during the fellowship. And it was, it was sort of a literary pilgrimage for me, and it was amazing. Um, you know, there are other writers that have influenced my work. Um, ben Okri, for instance. Um, we always talk about Chino Achebe because of his um, overwhelming influence on, on writers from the continent. The fact that he kind of projected a story about, about people who looked like you and, and spoke like you in a, in a, in a very uh, real sense. Uh, and for many people, that was the first time they were seeing something like that. That was, that was inspiring. So there, there are lots of influences, yeah. And of course, um, you know, I think one of the most important influences I, I have to mention is uh, Anthony Hope, who wrote uh, The Prisoner of uh, Rupert, um, The Prisoner of Zender, and, and Rupert of Hensel, fabulous books. Um, for me, they are important because I read them when I was 13. Okay. Uh, and they kind of set me on this trajectory. Because prior to that, I had been, um, I'd been writing, I've been sort of creative, drawing pictures, or even before I could write. And I knew I had this artistic inclination. But after reading those books, I kind of came to the conclusion that writing was my preferred mode of artistic expression. So. I was reading your blog yesterday night uh, in preparation for the interview, and uh, there's, there's an interesting uh, term that you use called the, uh, with respect to uh, Chibi and uh, other writers you say that there's an irreverent generation uh, in, in, in Nigeria now 
which uh, doesn't know how to engage with mm -hmm. uh, or engage critically i mean they know how to engage but engage critically with mm -hmm. with uh, people they disagree with mm -hmm. and uh, i don't know if you know this but uh, i mean in india too we've seen that mm -hmm. we've seen that uh, problem recurring i spoke to a author called hansda savendra shekhar mm -hmm. who uh, i think he was also at uh, yeah yeah I, you, his, uh, um, friend of mine so so it's a, it's, it's a recurring thing i mean it's not that you you can't criticize or you can't say anything yeah. you can but there are ways in which absolutely so so uh, absolutely. who what is this irreverent generation you are calling i think they are a generation that's uh, motivated by by social media mostly you know uh, people who because they have access to these platforms feel they could express whatever thought comes to their mind it's perfectly all right to express your thoughts but then again there are the ways you can engage with issues without um, degenerating to gutter language and uh, irrational arguments and uh, you know I, i i just feel that sometimes people just want to perform all those things mm -hmm. it may not be their sentiments exactly you know but they want to perform to to the gallery to the people who follow them on social media and kind of create this persona that is different from the real persona because a lot of these people if you if you meet them one on one they are completely different from from uh, the projections you have on on social media uh, the irreverence comes in the fact that they disregard the accomplishments of of generations that have preceded us you know um, yes it's fine you can argue and agree that Achebe's uh, Things Fall Apart is not the best book that was ever written. Nobody says it's the best book that's ever written, or people do say that, you know. But its importance cannot be questioned. It is a very, very important book, mm -hmm. you know. But there's a way of saying things like that. When you say it's rubbish, or because it's, I mean, he wrote the book 60, 70 years ago. Um, and then you have people who just want to dismiss everything like that. I think it's, it's very unfair. I think, um, it doesn't speak well of of people who engage in that form mm -hmm. you know but then again i think there's a certain level of irreverence that is necessary for people in my generation to to uh, you know step out of a shadow that has been cast over us for a very long time and not really a shadow a matrix that if you like african literature is supposed to kind of fit into which is that it has to explain africa it has to explain mm -hmm. war and famine and all those images that that is being projected about africa in the news uh, and you need you need to say you know what yeah this is a reality in certain places it's not the collective reality of the continent and there's another reality to the continent that you need to engage with which you are not doing because um, it's either you 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 have tunnel vision about the continent or you have a certain idea that you want to project. Mm -hmm. And a certain level of irreverence is needed to kind of break away from that and say, look, I'm doing what I want to do. I'm turning the story of the continent from the way I see it. And it's either you have to engage with that or you just, you know, continue on your own path. But uh, that irreverence, it's, it's something that is necessary to, to a certain degree. You know, it's finding the balance now that this generation has to kind of is something they have to engage with and say okay how do we find the balance between this irreverence and total disrespect for right. yeah since if since you've mentioned uh, news so much and and uh, you've been a working journalist for 10 years yeah. uh, and i was actually also reading some of your stories that you had written uh, like as newspaper as, as, as newspaper columns or, or or as pieces of journalism um, i mean i'm sure it's 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 one thing to think of how how it's reported in the west I, i think that's what you mean by how it's reported but uh, as a journalist yourself uh, how has how has your your career in journalism influenced uh, your your career as a writer maybe i'm very clear about uh, my stance on both journalism and and uh, fiction and i've always seen myself first as a writer then as a journalist and because this is something i grew up doing you know it was something that came naturally to me and uh, I made the decision to be a journalist consciously 
Uh, in a way, it was sort of to advance my, my writing, basically. Uh, because as an individual, I'm very, um, I'm, I'm comfortable being on my own, let me put it that way. And I realized quite early enough that I needed to engage more, you know, in order to write mm -hmm. stories that are more convincing. And for me, journalism was, was that way of engaging with people I would normally not have access to, um, like politicians whom I don't have uh, fondness for to, to a large extent, you know, um, like policemen, you know, and, and drug dealers and weed sellers and all sorts of people, right? As a journalist, you have access to these people and uh, you have access to their stories, mm -hmm. to their reality. And you engage them and you talk to them and they, they open up to you because of who you are, uh, which wouldn't be the case otherwise, I think. So you have a sense of um, this divergent realities that normally you wouldn't have accessed you know, so that's, that was the motivation for that. So um, my writing has influenced my, my journalism because it's given me perspectives on the issues that there's no absolute good and no absolute evil. You know, things are tainted either way. And, uh, and this, this, I suppose, is reflected in the way I write my journalism and I, the way I approach it, you know, which is also important because you have to have balance. And I think the influence journalism has had on my writing is um, this uh, idea of social responsibility that um, as a journalist you're supposed to have, especially a journalist practicing in a country like Nigeria, where you have to make decisions constantly about breaking a story and the collective good of, of people. I mean, it's something very difficult to kind of rationalize and say, well, you know, maybe this information is going to be detrimental to the society as a whole. It might incite people to anger, to protest. And in a community that is uh, multi-ethnic and multi-religious as Nigeria, you know, you have to consider the sensitivities in your projection. So that's, that has been really important to the work I do.